by my clock. It is just about that time. Welcome everybody. My name is Celine Figueroa and I am your virtual host tonight. Uh, we are so excited to get started with tonight's program. I have absolutely loved reading everybody's first memories of the night sky. Uh, we've got some really good ones in there. Hopefully we'll be able to, to point them out later. Um, a few quick housekeeping things. That chat will be how we will be able to see your comments tonight. We have so many of you watching and we're so, so grateful. So if you have questions as Dr. Katrina and Naomi present, have their presentations, go ahead and type them in there. We'll have a dedicated Q&A um, towards the last 20 minutes of the program tonight. You might not be able to see each other's comments, but we can see them and we will do our very best to get to as many of them as we can. Without further ado, to begin tonight's event, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kachun Yu, Assistant Curator of Space Science at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Welcome, Kachun. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Celine. Um, welcome everyone to 60 Minutes in Space. Uh, this is a monthly program uh, from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And for those of you who um, haven't um, seen this uh, before, what we do is we cover um, some of the uh, biggest news stories from uh, this past month. And uh, we did skip um, December, and uh, so you, you actually might uh, be hearing stories um, from December as well. And I am an astronomer by training, so I typically like to cover stories that take place outside of our solar system. And um, I also want to um, introduce Naomi Paquette, who uh, you just saw, um, and uh, she will be covering the second half of our uh, presentation um, tonight. And uh, before I get started, you know, feel free to um, throw in uh, any questions you have that you have into the chat, and Celine will be uh, gathering gathering those, and she'll be selecting questions um, at the end and um, when we do our Q and A. And so with that, I'm going to get started. <clears throat> and my first story um, actually has to do with uh, this particular. Um, <clears throat> news article. I actually, there were lots of um, news articles that came out, but uh, this is from the New York Times, um, and it's uh, a great title for uh, a, a news story about this um, scientific paper, Six Stars, Six Eclipses. The fact that ex it exists blows my mind. I think any scientist would love to um, <laughs> have a um, news story um, where, you know, you're, you're quoted um, about um, the, the scientific result being so amazing that it blows uh, people's minds. And basically, uh, this is a discovery of a six star system. And you know, in our solar system, uh, our, we have only a single sun, but in fact, um, at least half of the stars that we see out in the sky are actually multiple stars, uh, typically binaries, but sometimes you'll, fi you'll find triple systems and uh, quadruple systems are even rarer, but uh, the rarest um, or the, uh, the um, six um, star systems, or the sextuples. And uh, here is the title of the paper. So this is kind of an impressive title. There are 51 authors uh, representing uh, about 40 different institutions. So there are a lot of astronomers involved. And I want to point out uh, the, uh, the, the title. So the first part is just the name of the star, that uh, complicated alphanumeric um, set of symbols. But then the second part of the title is sextuply eclipsing sextuple star system. So, you know, this sounds vaguely um, double entendre-ish. Um, actually, it sounds like a double, double entendre. So what, what um, do we mean by a sextuply eclipsing sextuple star system? Well, a sextuple system is a six uh, star system, <clears throat> as I said, but a sextuply eclipsing, uh, what that means is that um, each of these stars are um, eclipsing each other. So this is a system where the stars uh, the or are orbiting in such a way that they're lined up, their orbits are lined up so that they have a chance to block each other as they are orbiting. So there, um, you know, this is a, a pretty rare scenario, but, um, but there are um, other six star systems out there and you might have even heard of um, some of them. So uh, one, of, oh, let's see. One of them is, um, <clears throat> actually, before I go into that, this is um, what the system looks like. 
Um, so you, uh, the, the way astronomers assign names to, uh, to star systems with multiple stars is they, um, it's not very imaginative, but they just call them A, B, and C. But in this case, uh, the A uh, system uh, is uh, the one um, off to the upper left. Um, and then there's also a C system that um, is just below it. And then the B system is off to the, um, to the right. And, uh, but each of these um, stars, A, B, and C, uh, is in fact um, another binary. So instead of uh, three stars orbiting each other, uh, each of those three are in fact another uh, pair of stars. And uh, this um, tells you um, how fast they orbit around each other. So the A system, those pair of stars orbits in just over a day. The C uh, system orbits in about a day and a half. The B system, those two stars orbit uh, just over a week. And then um, the, A, uh, the A and C systems orbit each other uh, every four years. And uh, the biggest orbit are between the A and system and C system stars and the B system, and they orbit every 2,000 years or so. <clears throat> and um, and here are the results of the paper. So um, we we sort of look at um, <clears throat> this is uh, breaking up the A, B, and C um, binary pairs, but the authors of the paper have also um, figured out how massive the stars are. So uh, the primary star, the, the, the main, the, the heaviest star in each binary is just over a, a one and a quarter solar masses, so about one and a quarter times the mass of our sun, whereas the smaller uh, pair of, of, of the pairs are between about 0.5 and 0.6 um, solar masses. And this, um, this six um, star system is about 1900 light years away, so it's pretty far. Now, um, there are um, stars um, that are um, sextuples that you um, have probably heard of. One of them is Castor, uh, which is in the pair of stars, uh, the brightest stars in the constellation of Gemini, which is uh, visible um, during the winter. Um, so, you know, um, right about now. And, um, and Castor is in fact a um, six star system. Um, Castor, um, is only about 50 light years away, but um, <clears throat> it has an A, B, and C pair. Um, and uh, an astronomer named Willem Herschel realized that um, A and B were two separate stars, but uh, the C um, wasn't identified un until decades later. Uh, but the, um, <clears throat> the orbital period for um, C going around A and B is at least 10,000 years. So this is definitely a much bigger system. And um, this, these set of six stars are all aligned um, so that they um, eclipse each other, but um, they do, um, <clears throat> but um, they, the binaries are definitely orbiting each other. Now, how um, the, the new st um, star was found was actually found by a satellite called TESS, which stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And TESS was actually launched to find planets and um, what it does is it stares at a portion of the sky for about 14 days at a time. And if a, um, a star beyond our sun has a planet that orbits it, uh, where its orbit lines up so that the uh, planet crosses the star, the starlight drops by a fraction of, 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 an, of an amount. And so by watching stars for uh, long periods of time, you know, two, two weeks at a time, and, and mapping or, uh, and seeing these dips in the starlight, you can find planets. Now TESS um, have look, is planning to look at most of the sky. So um, I, I believe over 90% um, of the sky. And so it doesn't stay on a particular patch uh, or a sector for very long. And that limits um, how much data you can gather. Now, instead of planets, let's say you're looking at a pair of binary stars. And uh, so we have at the, um, at the top, a graphic of those two um, stars um, orbiting each other. And at the bottom, we have a plot of the star's brightness. Uh, this is a plot um, astronomers call a light curve. And so uh, because these two stars are of different sizes and they are of different brightnesses, depending on whether the bigger star passes in front of the uh, smaller star or the smaller star passes in front of the bigger star, different amounts of light is blocked. And so you get different amounts of um, uh, changes 
and the brightness of, um, of what you're, uh, you're observing. Now, because stars are so far away, we don't actually see the two stars moving like this. We only see a single point of light in our detectors. And so really the only thing you can detect is the, um, the dip in the brightness of these stars. So here is another situation. We have a triple system. So if you look at the uh, figure in the uh, top right, you can actually see uh, two stars that are um, two smaller stars that are orbiting each other, and uh, both of them are orbiting around the bigger um, star. And you can see how complicated the uh, the light curve or the change in brightness is of this entire system. So basically, as you get more and more complex systems with more stars, uh, you have to uh, pull in or you have to sort of disentangle a lot of different effects. And so the way these astronomers, this team of um, this giant team of astronomers were able to do this was they actually used a NASA uh, supercomputer, the Discover computer, which is normally used to create climate um, simulations, so to simulate our atmosphere. But uh, this machine has about 129,000 processors, and uh, the astronomers used a machine learning algorithm, or basically an artificial intelligence algorithm, to look through the test data to, uh, to basically identify um, uh, changes in the pattern of light that mimicked or matched known uh, eclipsing binaries or, or eclipsing multiple star systems. And from about half a million candidate stars, um, they found about 100 systems that were at least three stars or more. And so they went in and um, looked close, more closely at those 100 systems and then found a single case where um, there were um, six stars in one system. And um, here is the light curve for that um, six star system. So you can see that it's super complicated and, um, and there are some straight lines there. Those are uh, places where uh, data is missing uh, because the um, telescope was beaming data back um, to the earth. Um, and um, you can see how complicated um, it is. But um, even from this um, data, just by um, folding over the data, they can um, identify three different periods. So uh, again, you know, we um, I mentioned earlier that the uh, the the stars are orbiting um, around each other, uh, or the pairs of stars are orbiting by one and a half days, 1.3 days, and uh, just over eight days, just over a week. And so um, when you um, <coughs> fold the data um, based on those periods, you actually see these dips um, show up in the starlight. And so that tells you, you know, that's a really good hint that you're on the right track. But uh, because um, tests observed this patch of sky for less than two weeks, so 13.7 days before it had to switch to a different part of the sky, the astronomers had to get additional data. And so um, what they did was they looked, um, got additional uh, telescope time. And so this plot is uh, basically a plot over time and it shows all the data that they gathered. And so the test data is that orange splot of dots over to the far right. And then the green dots um, were, were um, other um, additional telescope time that they got uh, after they got the test data. And then all the other dots prior to that, to the left of those orange uh, set of dots were telescope data from other telescopes that um, happened to be pointed at this particular part of the sky. And so there are a lot of telescopes that um, astronomers are using to survey the sky, and they were able to um, get some of this data and, um, and use it in their analysis. But uh, this, um, what we're seeing are, are the brightnesses of the stars as mapped by these telescopes. And so you can see that um, some of them um, jump around quite a bit. Um, that's that vertical scatter. And this tells you that the telescopes and their detectors have different sensitiv sensitivities. Um, they're just different um, quality uh, to the data from different observatories. And so all this has to be entered in to, uh, to make sense of. Um, and another problem is that um, you can't see um, any of those um, six stars separate from each other because this system is so far away. So what we're seeing here is um, the an image of um, the, uh, that star. 
And those squares are the pixels, the individual picture elements in the detector that was used um, uh, on test to, um, to detect uh, the, the sextuple uh, system. And, and they, um, just by um, looking at differences between when you had an eclipse or uh, for the different eclipsing pairs, they were able to show that, you know, they're really, all, all these stars are, do manage to uh, be at the same position. So, uh, so the six stars is, appear as one. And so again, you can really only um, look at the dip at or the changes in the brightness of the stars as a whole, you can't uh, make out the individual stars. So in order um, to figure out um, all the parameters of the system, the uh, astronomers had to use a statistical uh, technique called the Markov chain Monte Carlo. And um, I can't um, go really, um, we don't have the time um, to, to describe um, what this is, but um, you can think of um, all the different parameters that describe the system uh, with their er error bars as um, going into a particular model. And so as you run this model, you're trying to minimize the amount of errors. And so um, you kind of um, randomly um, walk your way as you run the model more and more times until you get um, a result that um, makes the most sense statistically speaking or have the fewest um, errors. And so that's what they did. And um, after they do that, they're able to basically extract out a lot of information about um, the six stars. So for the A binary system, they're uh, able to extract out uh, this particular light curve um, where the, um, the black dots are the data and the, um, the red dots um, are, are the model that they derived from the data. So you can see how well the model matches the data. And similarly for the B binary system, they were able to extract out a model that matches the data really well. For the C binary system, um, it's not as tight of a match, but you, know, you can definitely see that the light curve uh, matches pretty well. Um, <clears throat> they were also able to extract other uh, bits of data for the stars in the system. So here is a plot of the masses of those six stars. And you can see that there's a spread in those lines. And that's just an indication that this is a statistical model. So you're not getting exact uh, numbers, but you're getting a spread or a probability of what the masses in this case are most likely are for, uh, for those stars. You can also get the radius of the stars. Again, again, you can see that some stars are more tightly constrained than other stars. Um, you can also get the temperature and then also the distance and the ages of the stars. And so with that, you know, there's still um, somewhat of a mystery as to how uh, these types of um, sextuple systems form. Um, we think, um, you know, we have a decent understanding of star formation in the sense that um, stars form from giant clouds of gas that collapse uh, due to gravity. Uh, but astronomers have been building computer simulations and you know, using a lot of theoretical models um, that are informed by observations. And one of them is this model um, from uh, Matthew Bate. And what you're seeing is a molecular cloud and it's slowly collapsing. Those, so those two reddish blobs are collapsing inwards and they will form a pair of stars. And then one of the stars is actually gonna split off to form a binary. So right there, you can see a star um, splitting off. So this is a scenario where from uh, this particular model um, simulation, this computer simulation, you can actually see how um, gas flowing in um, as, and that gas is pulled in by gravity and it accretes onto the central stars. Um, the, uh, uh, the accreting gas can actually, in some cases, split up to form a binary. And so here are just some, some frames from that simulation where you have those two stars um, that originally uh, broke apart and that form from the collapsing cloud. Um, so gas is still flowing along those spiral arms um, into an accretion disk onto those stars. And um, as the stars orbit each other, uh, part of that spiral arm of flowing gas gets compressed. And that um, compression, due to the gravitational interactions of the two stars, can actually um, cause um, part of that gas to collapse to form um, a, a binary. So out of um, an initial binary, now you have another binary forming out of one of those stars. And so you can imagine uh, scenarios where you know, this can happen where 
uh, in a sextuple case, instead of a pair of um, stars forming during the core collapse, there are three stars that form. And then if you're really lucky, each of those three stars um, also uh, based on you know, the gravitational interactions, they um, collapse and split off to form a binary out of each of those. And so that's uh, a scenario in which you can get a uh, six stars coming out of one molecular core. All right, so with that, that is our, um, oh, and then here's the final frame of the animation. Um, that's my uh, first uh, big um, astronomy uh, story. And uh, my second and last story before I turn it over to Naomi is I just wanted to uh, talk briefly about the great Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, which you probably heard a lot about um, last month um, in December. You know, there was a Google doodle um, showing uh, the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction. And um, you know, these conjunctions actually um, occur every um, 20 years or so. And it, uh, this one just happens to be um, you know, the best one uh, out of um, the last several hundred years, you know, at least 400, some people say the last 800 years. And basically a conjunction is when, um, in this case, Jupiter and Saturn, um, in, you know, they, they're they widely separated in their orbits, but from, from their location, uh, from Earth, they appear uh, to line up in space. And so uh, here is how they look on December 21st, uh, which is when uh, they got closest to each other. And if we zoom back out to uh, show the view um, from out of the plane of the solar system, what I'm going to do now is we're going to actually go backwards in time and, uh, and see um, what the last conjunction 20 years ago, back in the year 2000, looked like. And so we're going to run this backwards. And what you'll see is that the planets actually orbit at different rates. And so the Earth orbits much faster, Jupiter uh, slower still, and Saturn slow, even slower still. And so you know, these conjunctions don't take place um, every um, once, you know, of our Earth years or once a Jupiter orbit, but it's a uh, geometric um, combination of um, the uh, orbits of um, Jupiter and Saturn. And in this case, back in May uh, of 2000, um, you know, that was the last conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. But as you'll see, uh, the two planets weren't as close and that's just because the, uh, the, uh, the planes of the uh, orbits are all tilted. So Saturn and Jupiter uh, are tilted by about a degree from each other. And, um, and in this case, uh, they were also um, way too close to the sun. So it was really difficult to, uh, to really see anything. And um, here, I'm gonna zoom out and we can see the orbits tilted with respect to each other. So basically this tells you that, you know, even though these conjunctions take place every 20 years, they might have different, um, uh, yeah, they might not be deemed as great conjunctions. They, um, they don't get as close as they could be. And hopefully uh, many of you were able to get out and, um, and, and um, see these conjunctions. You know, if you saw them, you can post into the chat what you thought of it and, and where you saw them. But um, if you go onto Facebook or other social media, you can find lots of people uh, posting pictures. And what's great about this particular conjunction is that it was visible uh, from the Northern Hemisphere. So really, uh, there were uh, lots of pictures posted from around the world. Um, a lot of Indian uh, astral uh, uh, amateur astronomers who took astrophotography. So here you can see um, a pair. Um, this is actually a couple days before the closest approach um, where um, the moon was also uh, visible uh, close to Jupiter and Saturn. Um, here is a picture from Portugal and uh, from, from Lisbon, where you're seeing uh, the harbor in Lisbon. And what's really nice about this picture is that there's nothing else in the sky except for Jupiter and Saturn up to the uh, near the top and the right of the picture. Um, here's one taken uh, by my friend Henry, Henry Fruit, um, who uh, lives in Washington, DC. He's a planetary scientist who works on the New, Hor New Horizons mission that flew by Pluto, but he's um, a great photographer. So he took this um, with uh, Saturn and Jupiter next to the uh, National Cathedral in Washington, DC. And then this is also another picture of his um, taken uh, in DC next to some um, radial um, antennae. Um, and, um, and if you look really closely, you'll see that um, there are a couple of moons on either side of Jupiter, which is the brighter spot off to the left. 
Um, here's another great shot from India. And again, this took a lot of coordination you know, to get the person and the rock uh, face um, or the, the hill that he's on um, set up. And again, you can see some of the moons uh, on either side of Jupiter. Um, and here's a close up of that, uh, pointing out which moons, uh, which of the Galilean moons uh, are visible. Here is a great shot um, from um, Tom Palakis in Arizona. And, um, <clears throat> and here um, he's exposed the shot in such a way that you can really see the banding of the, uh, the atmosphere on uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And you can also see one of the moons, I believe that's uh, Ganymede to the right of Jupiter. And then here um, is one case where they overexposed the planets, but uh, then uh, made the moon stand out um, a lot better. And in this case, you can see um, two of um, Saturn's moons, Titan and Tethys. And then finally, I will end with uh, this last one, which is a great shot where you're seeing the banding on the planets as well as the, the moons. And this one is from the United Arab Emirates. So, you know, uh, these are great pictures and uh, goes to show you that astronomy is, um, you know, is greatly loved by people from all around the world. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Naomi. All right. Thank you, Kachun. Um, so I'm going to continue with some stories coming from this month, uh, focusing more on our solar system and then even closer to Earth here. So we'll get this up on my screen. So the first story I want to talk about are two of our favorite missions from NASA, Juno, and InSight. We got great news this month that both missions have been extended for funding. So let's take a look quickly at those two missions. So Juno is, uh, has been orbiting uh, Jupiter for several years now. It's faced some complications and its mission it hasn't been able to approach quite as close as we hope, but still it is doing a lot of work to help us understand what's beneath the surface of Jupiter, looking at its atmosphere, its cloud structure, and hoping through detecting its gravitational field and magnetic field to find out what's at the center of Jupiter. Um, in fact, its name is rooted in mythology, Juno being the wife of Zeus or Jupiter. Um, and is said to be the only one who could see beneath this cloud. So got that name there. And this has a great Colorado connection. Uh, Lockheed Martin Space Systems here in Denver built the spacecraft and we have lots of scientists here in Colorado studying it. And in addition to some of the amazing data coming out of it, I just wanna take a moment to show some of the images here um, because one spectacular thing Juno has done is released all of its raw images to the public. So when you see beautiful finished images like this, it's often from citizen scientists or artists who have gone in and colorized and processed these images and you get some beautiful pieces of art. And we are so excited that this mission will be extended through September of 2025 or until the end of the life of the spacecraft. Uh, Juno is facing a lot of radiation from Jupiter, which is not helping any of its electronic components. Uh, so hopefully it will last till that 2025 date because they are hoping to expand its search of the Jupiter system and its study of the Jupiter system um, to fly by some of the larger Jovian moons. So Ganymede, which is our largest moon in our solar system, Europa, which of course is this beautiful ice moon with potential for a liquid water underneath the surface, and Io, which is highly volcanic. So here's hoping we will see even more from Juno. The other mission is a little closer to home. That is the InSight lander, which is studying Mars at the moment. Um, it arrived in 2018, so just a couple of years ago. And over the last two years, it has been looking at a similar type mission to Juno and that it's trying to figure out what's at the center of Mars. What is that core? Is it still liquid, molten? Do we have an active planet? Is Mars more of a dead planet like we thought it was? Um, and so it's been doing a lot of seismic research. And in that time, it's been at Mars actually for 770 souls or more than that uh, as of today, um, soul being a Martian day and taking over 5,000 images, which is really incredible. And this mission has been extended for another two years. So until December of 2022, 
And the goal of that is really to build a longer data set for those seismic activities. Uh, so one of its instruments, SICE, has been identifying and detecting Mars quakes. And by looking at how those vibrations travel through Mars, we can learn a lot about what's beneath the surface. And we'd love to see a bigger data set for that. But it'll also continue its operation of its Mars weather station. So if you think it's chilly in Colorado today, feel warmer by checking out the weather on Mars. The high was 10 degrees today and a low of negative 101. So I already feel toastier with our snowy weather today. Unfortunately, however, one of the instruments will not be continuing on, and that is the mole. No, not a real mole, a robotic mole. Okay, really, this was just an excuse to use this oatmeal cartoon again. Um, but the mole is one of the big instruments for uh, insight, and that is actually its heat probe, or HP3. And so the goal of this heat probe was to hammer down about, oops, and I apologize, that video is not going, there we go, hammer down about 16 feet into the surface. And so you can see this uh, video here showing how this was worked. This was designed by the German Aerospace Center. And by forcing that uh, kind of pointed probe downward, we would take measurements of the temperature on several points on the way down. And it would also drag with it this temperature sensitive uh, ribbon, if you will, that allowed us to take temperature at multiple points through the way down. And to be successful, to get us information, it really needed to go about 10 feet below the surface. And this is so much deeper than any sort of uh, lander or rover had been able to do before. Um, unfortunately, as of just a few days ago, they've called it quits on this particular instrument. And the reason for that is the regolith on Mars is not at all what we expected it to be like at this location. It actually has this tendency to be able to clump and it doesn't provide enough friction for that hammering motion to be successful. So they've only been able to get this down about two to three centimeters. And they've been trying all sorts of different techniques uh, like using the scoop on this rover to be able to push down on that hammer, hoping it would go deeper. Um, the scoop actually wasn't part of the mission. It was there on the spacecraft because it was a backup spacecraft for the Phoenix lander, but the scoop didn't have a purpose for this mission, um, but was a really helpful tool in trying to make this heat probe or this mole successful. But not all is lost. Um, we still learned a lot. First of all, scientists are going to be puzzling over the difference in this regolith here or the soil here than what we saw at other Mars locations because this instrument was designed based on data we had from previous missions. So what's going on with the, the regolith or the soil in this location? But scientists have also gotten experience using the scoop um, and engineers, which is really important because they are actually going to use this scoop to bury a ribbon that is connecting the seismometer to the spacecraft. So it's a ribbon similar to what you're seeing right here that transports the data back from that seismometer to the spacecraft. And because of temperature fluctuations, they've actually been seeing a lot of popping and crackling uh, in the data. And they hope by covering it, they'll actually get better data. So, Unfortunately, part of our mission not successful, but still getting a lot of really great information from InSight. And here's till December 2022, where we can learn even more. But that's not all for Mars. We've got three more missions arriving to Mars just next month. The first of this is actually from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, this is their HOPE mission their first mission to Mars, which will arrive on February 9th. It is an orbiter that's designed to study the uh, planet-wide atmospheric dynamics and weather on Mars. And this has a really cool Colorado connection. Uh, this spacecraft was actually mostly built and tested up in Boulder at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. The United Arab Emirates partnered with LAST to develop the spacecraft very, very rapidly in only six years, which I know it sounds like a long time, but this is really fast for spacecraft development, I promise you. Um, and it was this amazing collaboration. So 
cheers to our colleagues up at LASP and out at the UAE for sending their first mission to Mars. And then the next mission is actually a Chinese mission. It is really ambitious. This is China's first mission to Mars. And they are sending not just an orbiter, not just a rover, but both, uh, which for a first mission is, is incredible. This is called the Tianwen uh, One mission, which means questioning the heavens. And the orbiter will be searching for possible pockets of water uh, below the surface of Mars. So you may remember a couple of years ago, there was a headline that came out that a European orbiter on Mars used radar. So uh, actually radio waves bouncing back and studying how they bounce back and found mud or possible liquid water beneath the surface. So we're really excited to have another instrument at Mars that'll be able to do similar work and hopefully verify some of that data. And then they're also going to send a rover. Now the rover won't be landing on Mars until May. Uh, this is arriving just a day after the UAE mission. So they'll be spending a few months kind of scoping out the landscape, but it's expected that the rover will land in Utopia Planitia, which is in the Northern part of the hemisphere of Mars that may have some subsurface ice. And that is exactly what that rover is gonna be looking for and studying. And then of course the big one, uh, we are so excited to celebrate at DMNS with several events coming up. Um, as I think Celine just mentioned in the comments there is the Perseverance Rover and Ingenuity spacecraft. Perseverance and Ingenuity are following NASA's directive of follow the water. So they're landing in Jezero Crater, which is thought to have been covered in liquid water um, and maybe home to an ancient river delta. This will arrive on February 18th. Um, so keep an eye out on our website. Uh, we just, I think, linked that in our comments to see what events we've got going on that day, as well as after uh, for school groups as well. But this one is another first. This is the first time we've ever tried to fly a spacecraft on Mars with the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, so this will be not only just an engineering test in this 30 days where it will be flying, but it's also gonna be helping to scope out possible uh, specimens for perseverance to study or help plan out a driving path. So we're really hopeful for that. And again, Lockheed Martin Space Systems involved in this, they actually helped to, actually did design, I should say, the, uh, the uh, storage packet, excuse me, for uh, the Ingenuity spacecraft and the mechanism for it to deploy um, and the aero shell, that heat shield, that'll be protecting perseverance as it enters the Martian atmosphere. So keep an eye out for all sorts of fun events as we celebrate perseverance on the day of landing and beyond. And if you're in the new Space Odyssey, we have little helicopters we're flying on our simulated Mars mission talking about some of that science as well. Now, I wanna take a totally different focus. Um, one of my favorite topics is a topic called archaeoastronomy or the astronomy of ancient cultures, how they interacted with the night sky and how they left that reflected in the items they left behind from artifacts to entire cities or ceremonial centers aligned to the sky like Chaco Canyon. And this has been top of mind because we cover this in our Keepers of Knowledge Interactive in Space Odyssey Reimagined. And a couple of papers came out this month around this item here called the Nebra Sky Disc. This is in Germany and a museum right now. And it is thought to be the oldest accurate depiction of the night sky. So first of all, you've got that beautiful blue kind of green patina all over the bronze with these different objects that are covered in gold leaf. So let's take a look at some of those symbols first, then we'll get to the controversy, the two papers firing back at one another. So first of all, we have the crescent moon. It's a lot of cultures around the world use this as a timekeeper, a way to mark the passage of time. So it's not unreasonable. A society in Bronze Age Germany would have not done the same. We also have this circle here. It's debated whether this is a full moon or the sun, but the sun makes a lot of sense symbolically. It is a giver of life. It brings life to the plants and the crops. And when you tie it with some other things that we have in this item, that connection seems to make a little bit of sense. You have 23 different spots kind of scattered throughout this disc, which we think represent stars. You can debate constellations, whether they're there or not. 
but they're pretty certain that this grouping of stars is actually an object we can see in our night sky right now. And that's the Pleiades star cluster or the seven sisters. And we know the ancient Greeks used this uh, to mark harvesting times. It first appears in October when you would be harvesting and disappears in March from the sky when you would be planting. So it makes sense that this would have been maybe something marking an agrarian calendar. And we see this in other Bronze Age cultures um, in the world. So amazing to have these accurate depictions. There's a couple other symbols in there as well. Uh, we see these gold arcs. And so on the right, we think that probably marks the horizon. There might've been another one on the left. This was added after the fact. You can get into debates whether there's some cool angles that happen that mark sunrises and sunsets for solstices or not. But then you see that arc at the bottom. And what we think that represents is actually a, uh, a sun chariot of sorts. And we found this symbol in Bronze Age Scandinavia. But originally, we see this more in ancient Egypt, where the sun god Ra was said to take this kind of boat through the nighttime and be reborn at sunrise. So really amazing uh, symbolism happening here. So amazing object, lots of emotional attachment to this, especially in Germany, where it was found. So where is that controversy? Well, the controversy comes from its age. And the reason we don't really know its age is because of how it was found. Archaeologists, when they unearth a, an object, take as much context from around it as they can. Well, this was actually found by looters in 1999. They were out uh, on a site outside of Nebra, Germany, on a hillside using a metal detector to try and find artifacts they could sell to archaeologists to try and get some money. And they actually excavated it using a pickaxe, which did some damage to the sky disk itself. So it took the sting of police working with archaeologists to be able to get this object, as well as the objects it was found with back in the possession of the state, because this was illegal in Germany. You need a permit to be able to excavate artifacts like this. So we don't have the context we normally would to say, aha, this is the age it's at. So the two papers that came out in the last two months are basically scientists firing back at each other to say, how old is this object? And so the currently accepted theory is that it's from the Bronze Age. So how do we know this? About 1600 BCE or before Common Era. So the first thing we can look at is that patina, that uh, blue green color you're seeing there. That's actually bronze disease. And it's a corrosive process where chloride molecules like chlorine in the salts in the soil interact with that bronze and they produce microscopic crystals and that look either green or white. And as these microscopic crystals age, they grow. And so looking at this artifact underneath the microscope, we see relatively large crystals with these bubbles similar to what you see there on the right. Um, so this would have not been blue or green in the past, it would have been that bronze color. So this really lends itself to the authenticity that it is a Bronze Age artifact. So what else? Well, we have to look at the artifacts that it was found with. And these two swords are really important because they had wood handles associated with them. And that wood we could use carbon dating on. And that's what gave us that date of 1600 BCE. But a new paper is arguing, well, some looters found it. How do we know they really found it there? Because we've gone back to the site. It seems consistent. Like the soil seems consistent. How do we know? Well, this new paper came out saying that that artifact was actually moved to that site to be associated with other Bronze Age artifacts to try and make it seem a little bit rarer, a little bit more, uh, well, frankly, worth more money. And they point to an account from the looters that they gave in a book claiming that they did find it at a different site and moved it. And there are some antiquities traders that have verified that story. Now realize we didn't even get the site of that hill site outside of Never Germany out of them without a plea bargain. <laughs> so there is some question. And also an Iron Age object, a little bit newer, seems to make more sense for a culture really looking at the night sky. Previously, only Bronze Age artifacts we found have been weaponry. But 
the uh, museum that actually owns the sky disc came back with a paper just earlier this month. Um, it's the State Museum of Prehistory. And the director wrote another paper saying, look, you're forgetting a lot of this evidence. Don't forget the bronze disease. Don't forget the fact that we found uh, samples of, of soil that seem consistent with what we see on the disc. We found that damage from the pickaxe. This all seems to be consistent to their original story. And the site itself is a darn good place for astronomical observations. You would have seen sunrises and sunsets. So the question remains, but we think it is probably Bronze Age. And another reason this story is so fascinating is this iconography remains really relevant today and really resonates with people who are exploring the sky. In fact, we see this same iconography and the new mission patch for the SpaceX Crew-3 mission, which will launch later this year. And so this patch was designed by a European Space Agency astronaut um, who is scheduled to fly on the Crew-3 mission along with uh, two NASA astronauts and another astronaut to be assigned. And so we can see that solar disk, the crescent, the Pleiades there, and it's mixed in with some symbols from the Pioneer uh, and Voyager Golden Records that were sent out into space carrying messages from Earth. And the name of this, mess, uh, this particular mission is gonna be called Cosmic Kiss. And that astronaut says it is a declaration for the love of space and that these artifacts show a fascination with space that spans the ages. The Cosmic Kiss mission builds our curiosity of all those who came before us as exploration advances, our understanding of the earth, our solar system and life itself continues. So really incredible that this ancient object, whether it is from 1600 BCE or 600, is still brings meaning and really shows that connection to the night sky. So to end, I just wanna highlight a couple more things coming up this year as we're in the new year. We of course, Perseverance coming up next month, but then we have two crewed launches in, well, two human-based missions coming up in May. SpaceX's Crew-2 Dragon mission is uh, launching on March 31st. That'll be carrying two NASA astronauts an astronaut from JAXA, which is the Japanese Space Agency, and one astronaut from the European Space Agency. And then that Crew-3 mission, like I mentioned, is expected to launch sometime in the fall, probably September is the goal at this point. But SpaceX is just one of two companies that has been awarded contracts to help NASA get astronauts back to the International Space Station and expand our crew capacity. The other one is Boeing, um, and they are working with their Starliner capsule. Now, the Starliner capsule had an uncrewed test, OFT-1, uh, which was unsuccessful. It did not dock with the International Space Station, likely due to some software failure. OFT-2 is scheduled to happen in March. They have passed software reviews by NASA. They're very excited and expected to be able to dock with the International Space Station. And if that is successful, they'll be able to send a crew mission up, hopefully later this year, potentially as early as summer 2021. So lots more coming in the world of space sciences here. And with that, I think I will leave the remainder of our time for Q&A. Wonderful. We can have Kachun join us for this portion as well. Let me put us in gallery view. Um, so we've got about 12 minutes left for Q&A, and I do want to say we've had some amazing questions come through, and I will not be able to get to all of them. So I'm going to do my best to go through themes for everything. Um, so the first one, Naomi, it will go straight off after that sun disk. People are wondering what the difference between uh, the process of dating uh, an object like that and dating something like art um, can it be restored in the same way? Can it be carbon dated? What does that look like? So yeah, they were able to carbon date the wood that came with that sword, but unfortunately you can't carbon date bronze. It just, it, you're just not able to. And so we have to look at other clues like that bronze disease potentially. Um, but a big part of archeology span is learning about the context. We're extraordinarily methodical about how artifacts are dug up you know, marking every layer, creating a very strategic grid to find the context and be able to get clues from that environment. And unfortunately, 
a big part of the controversy and the, the questioning around this desk is we just don't have that. Archaeologists have gone back to that site, but it's not the same as unearthing that artifact in context. Well, uh, a few folks in the chat said that you did a fantastic job at explaining that debate, that back and forth. And I, I like that this is the drama that happens in the science community. It's trying to, to, to pinpoint the date of cool things like that. It's kind of fun to see those scientific rivalries. I'll never forget a supervisor I had in college who literally jumped for joy when we were pr proved a, a rival wrong with some basic mathematics. <laughs> and the best part about these types of rivalries is that everybody comes with receipts. You come with evidence and you back everything up. Exactly. So I love it. Kachun, speaking of uh, coming with receipts and evidence, um, we had a few people wonder about the sex double systems. Um, is there any possibility that there could be planets? Can other systems like this actually have it? And is there any evidence that says that the one that we were just talking about in your fantastic presentation has any? Yeah, um, so right now they don't know um, if planets um, are in the system, but um, it's probably unlikely. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show the slide. And I apologize for covering up um, uh, too much of the um, earlier slides. Um, I was taking up too much uh, of the center part of my screen. But um, so here is uh, that, um, so this is not to scale in the sense that, um, you know, these orbits aren't to scale. Um, the stars, uh, the sizes of the stars are to scale, but um, their distances from each other are not. But if you look at the, uh, the, the binary pairs, you know, um, the A uh, pair of stars orbits in um, 1.3 days, the C pair of stars orbits in 1.6 days, and the B uh, pair of stars orbits in 8.2 days. And so each of those binary pairs of stars were actually orbiting much, much closer um, to each other than Mercury orbits our sun. So they were really tightly packed together. Um, now the A and C um, binaries were orbiting um, once every four years. And so that would, um, if, if you were to plop um, the A and C star system into our solar system, both of those, you know, all four of those stars would be orbiting uh, within the, um, the inner um, solar system. So, you know, somewhere between Mars um, and Jupiter. And uh, for um, stars that orbit um, so close to each other, if you had any planets that were, had similar distances um, to the planets in our solar system, uh, the gravity of those stars would um, probably end up disrupting the planets, you know, perhaps not within um, a few orbits, but um, definitely over time, um, planets would get scattered, they would get launched out of the system, they'd get launched, um, they would fall into a star. Um, so it's uh, probably unlikely um, A and C um, have any uh, planets unless they orbit it uh, much, much further away. Um, the B uh, system, uh, again, those two stars orbit a lot closer than Mercury does. So you can imagine, you know, a, a planet or planets that orbited um, at the same distance as Mars or, or, or Earth does, and uh, they wouldn't be disrupted as much. Uh, but basically, the further um, away they orbit, uh, you, uh, the greater the chance that they would get disrupted by the other stars in the system. Again, I love that scientifically based answer. Thank you, Kajun. <laughs> So uh, another question that came up that came up a few different times that I'll direct to both of you, Kachun, we can start with you, is that there seems to be a lot of really cool things that have happened in our solar system in just the last couple of months. We keep hearing once in a lifetime, we keep hearing this new scientific find. Are we, what's different? Um, is, was 2020 that monumental of a year uh, or were we just paying more attention because we were working from home? I think it's uh, probably the latter. Uh, you know, people pay more attention, things get um, more press or uh, people uh, promote things more often just because there are a lot of media providers and they like to you know, promote um, exciting news. Um, so people will tune in um, to, to them. Um, you know, the, the, and um, you know, it's, of course uh, the, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction is um, pretty rare, but if you pay attention to astronomical news, there's you know interesting things um, always happening every year, but uh, but there are some things that I think uh, do get over promoted. You know I, I think you keep hearing about supermoons um, once a year or so, and uh, in my opinion they're actually really not that super, um, and I can explain you know um, a lot more about that. But um, but um, but I think you know for the most part um, it is uh, people getting uh, excited about certain events and. Um, 
you just hear it a lot more in the news and in social media. And Go ahead, I also add to that, you know, the world of astronomy is really rapidly evolving. We are entering an era that I like to call big data astronomy, that we just are doing these huge surveys of the sky. We're gathering so much more data at higher and higher resolution. And our technology is constantly advancing, allowing us to make these really amazing discoveries that might not have been technologically possible in previous years. Um, but yes, there are a lot more people working at home processing data. It's a good thing. Um, and in terms of the night sky, I'm personally really thrilled. I think people have taken a lot more time to look up and notice things. We've gotten a lot more calls about what the heck is that, which was sometimes planets, sometimes meteorites, sometimes loon balloons from Google. Um, but people are, are reconnecting with the night sky, which I think is really exciting. I love that. And for those of us that want to continue to stay informed about the happenings in the solar system, do either of you have any sites that you recommend for us to keep of course, 60 Minutes in Space will always be your first stop. But in between our program, any recommendations on where to look? Yeah, I think uh, um, you know, NASA sites are always um, really good. If you just do um, you know, a search, um, a Google search, and, and you look for um, sites um, that are associated with NASA, they have the nasa.gov um, URL. You can uh, be pretty sure that they're reliable. Um, and that you know, they do a good job of vetting all of their news so that it's accurate. Um, there are um, also a lot of um, space news sites out there, uh, like uh, space.com, um, space uh, Universe Today, um, that um, do you know, a pretty decent job. Uh, but uh, because uh, they are journalists, you know, sometimes they can um, get a detail here and there wrong. But for the most part, um, they're pretty good as well. Anything to add to that, Naomi? Ditto. Uh, <laughs> and also things like uh, if you see an article pop up for something like Scientific American or um, even Discover Magazine, those are, are usually pretty well vetted. Those oftentimes pop up in my Google News feed. So another way to keep an eye out. Wonderful. Well, we're just about at that time. Before we end, I'd love to hear any parting thoughts and I'd love to hear both of your answers to our icebreaker question. What's your first memory of the night sky? Naomi, do you want to start us off? Uh, my first memory of the night sky, I grew up in the mountains of Colorado in Georgetown, and we had a window over our kitchen sink that looked over the town of Georgetown, which is kind of in a valley and had a swatch of night sky. And I remember seeing something really bright and asking my dad about it and him telling me it wasn't a star. It's actually a planet called Venus. Um, and so just having this kind of mind bending experience that a, only a six or seven year old can of like, there's different distances in space. What? You can study more than just counting the stars. So that's my first memory. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Final thoughts. Keep an eye out for all these launches coming up. Uh, you know, of course, Perseverance will be covering uh, with DMNS, but NASA TV is fantastic. SpaceX has a great feed um, on their YouTube channel as well. So watching these things live is really exciting. Thank you, Naomi. Kachun, what's your first memory? I don't think I, I have any um, really memorable first memories of looking at the sky because I um, grew up in places where, or at least I, you know, I, I was in places where there was a lot of light pollution. And so um, at most I could see a handful of stars. And so uh, my love of, of astronomy wasn't by looking at the sky, but was um, actually just by reading about it. So, um, so, so that's my answer. And then as far as uh, something to think about, um, I think uh, for astronomers, um, towards the end of the year, the biggest uh, bit of news um, that will, you know, or event that will be coming up will be the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, which has been delayed and delayed and delayed for multiple years, uh, but it's the successor to Hubble, and I think we'll be hearing more about that um, when the time comes. Thank you, Kachun. And what a great reminder that sometimes books is how we explore. We actually just had a chat come through from someone who said that they were currently reading a space book to their little one as they're watching this program. So what a great, great uh, way to connect that. Well, thank you, everybody. That's about all the time that we have for tonight. We hope you enjoyed these two fantastic space scientists as they guided us through the news and were and vetted their sources and taught us all about uh, Mars, stars, and beyond that. So thank you both for joining us tonight. 
we will hopefully see you all um, for on February 24th for our next 60 Minutes in Space. And of course, the museum is always doing fun things. Take a look at our website to see what we're doing. For that Perseverance uh, landing, we will do that live. We don't have the event up on the website quite yet. So keep an eye out on our socials. I think it's gonna be both on our Facebook and YouTube. So we'll have a whole event for you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Good night, all.